Glad you could come this evening. People in our society often want to receive the benefits of uh, various relationships without the responsibilities that are involved. For example, we have a number of people that want, seem to want the privileges of marriage without the commitment that's involved in being husband and wife. And then there are those who want the privilege of being citizens, the benefits of being citizens, but they don't want to follow the rules for properly becoming citizens. And there are others who want the benefits of a job without doing the work that the job requires. The same thing is true many times in religion. That is, there are people who want, in particular, the benefits of Jesus' death without following the requirements that the scripture gives to receive those benefits and without understanding what the death of Jesus involves or requires of us. What I want us to do in our study together this evening then is I want us to consider the consequence of the cross. That is, what is the consequence, what is the cross, the death of Jesus, what does it mean in various different areas that we're going to talk about. We can talk about lots of areas because we're going to see the death of Jesus is part of the foundation of the gospel and almost everything the gospel relates to it one way or the other. But in particular, we will observe the fact that uh, several areas where people don't seem to see the connection often between the cross and other aspects of the gospel. So to start with, let's notice the connection be of the, between the cross and forgiveness of our sins. Now, this is one area that people seem to appreciate in many cases. That is, they recognize the need for forgiveness, and if they at all consider themselves Christians, they recognize the cross that relates to it. But we have many liberal denominations today that do not emphasize forgiveness at all, in many cases, because their emphasis uh, as, does not involve a concern about sin. They're involved in social interests and physical circumstances in this life and so on. But God's word emphasizes a connection between the cross and forgiveness. So in Isaiah 59 and verse 2, we're told that your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Every person as they reach an age where they're responsible for their lives has a sin problem. Sin separates from God and leads to eternal punishment. Now notice with me then John chapter 3 and verse 16, please. John chapter 3 and verse 16. And we'll see in the passage that most people are familiar with, but the significance of Jesus' death as regards our forgiveness. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we understand then that the death of Jesus, that's the gift that God gave, was the sacrifice of his son, leads to not perishing, but everlasting life. And so, uh, Jesus died for our salvation, our forgiveness of sins. Look at Matthew chapter 20, and verse 28 with me, please. Matthew chapter 20, and verse 28. Matthew 20, and verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus came, he said, to give his life as a ransom. So there's the connection between forgiveness of sins and the death of Jesus. The connection is that he's died as a ransom to forgive us, that we might have everlasting life, that we might be forgiven of our sins. And Ephesians 1 and verse 7 then tells us that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, there are many people that put an emphasis on the cross as a, a symbol, a, uh, that they wear, maybe they have it on their church building, they may put it on the wall in their home, they may uh, wear it around their necks. But do they really understand the consequences of sin and the need for forgiveness and therefore the need for the cross? Are they just going through the motions? Is it just a symbol? Or do they realize that without that death of Jesus, we would have no hope of eternal life? Now, there may be some people who do recognize the cross as regards forgiveness, but there's some other areas we'll talk about that they may not recognize. But first of all, I want to emphasize the fact that without the cross of Jesus, we could not be forgiven of sins. We could not have a hope of eternal life. But now notice with me, 
Another area. Oops, excuse me. What about the connection between the death of Jesus and the gospel? The Bible also teaches that the gospel, the cross is essential. The gospel and the cross go together. John 3.16 said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him can have everlasting life, but how do people believe? Well, Romans 10.17 says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if you want to benefit from the cross of Jesus, you need the gospel. You need the message that tells you about Jesus and about his cross. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the first four verses. Paul is describing here the gospel as he preached it, the basis of the gospel, the fundamentals of it. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So notice what Jesus says here, or Paul says here about the gospel. He says fundamentally to the gospel is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Now he's not saying that's all to the gospel. The New King James there says, I deliver to you first of all that which I received. Some of the newer translations say I deliver to you of first importance. What he's saying here is not that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the whole gospel, but it's the basis of it. It's the foundation of it. Everything else about the gospel is based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. What that means is if the, Jesus' death is essential, then the gospel is essential. But there are some people, it seems to me, who don't appreciate that, who don't recognize that connection. For several, there are some people that trust in human ideas, human thoughts, and human evidence in religion. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians again, this time in chapter 1. And we'll begin in verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Those who are saved must recognize the cross the message of the cross as the power of God. And then going down to verses 23 and 24. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So the message of the gospel is the power of God, but it's a message about the cross. The cross and the gospel go together. The cross is fundamental to the gospel. But the gospel is fundamental to our being saved. And so what we need to teach and preach to people, he says, is the message of the cross. Then go to chapter 2, the first five <laughs> verses. And notice how he compares that to other things in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. <laughs> I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Okay, so what he's saying again is, the gospel is the message of the cross of Christ, and to him, that's what I preached. I preached to you about Christ crucified. And when he says that, he's including all these other things we're going to talk about, because the things we're going to talk about are based on the cross of Christ, what he's saying is, I did not talk to you about human wisdom, man's opinion, man's ideas, because he said, I wanted my preaching to be in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, the power of God. That's where our faith should be. What happens today, though, is some churches, some preachers, try to convince people to accept certain religious views by talking about appealing about church tradition, or the views of educated scholars, or uninspired history, or other human sources. Well, that shows a lack of confidence in the gospel. When you use something other than the gospel to convince people to believe a viewpoint in religion, 
You're showing you don't really believe, recognize the importance of the gospel. Even if the, the conclusions were right, that would still be the wrong approach. But what usually happens when you begin to emphasize some other way other than the gospel to teach people, you almost always invariably end up teaching error because you've got the wrong source of your teaching. Some people even use uh, fleshly attractions to lead people to the church. Um, fun and food, parties and dinner, dinners and carnivals and magic shows and entertainment. And again, that shows a lack of faith in the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to salvation, Romans 1 and verse 16. To be cleansed from our sins, we need the power of Jesus' blood. But we have to believe in Jesus to receive that power. To believe in Jesus, we have to hear, have the gospel. We have to understand the gospel and follow it. So if we appreciate the death of Jesus, then we need to appreciate the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. Our faith must stand in God's power, not in the wisdom of men, the methods of men. That means we've got to preach and teach the gospel, and only the gospel has the source of our faith and our belief. And the, faith, the, the, gospel, uh, the gospel of Jesus' death teaches us that. Gospel, Jesus' death, go together. And you really can't have one without the other, and we need to appreciate the significance of that. So we've seen that when you understand the cross, then you appreciate your need for forgiveness. When you understand the cross, you also appreciate your need for the gospel. But let's go further. The cross and the church are also tied together. A lot of times people try to separate these. People will say, well, you're saved by Jesus, but you don't need to be a member of the church. You don't need to attend church meetings. You don't need to be involved in the work of the church, they tell you. And so I've heard people tell me, well, Jesus saves you, not the church. So we should preach Christ and not the church. Well, let's notice then, as we have in these other areas, look at the connection, the gospel says, between the cross and the church. First of all, the church was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Look in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Talking to the elders, Paul says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So here, the death of Jesus is what Jesus gave to purchase the church to make it his church. Now, do people intentionally give their lives for things that are not important to them? A man may run into a, a burning house uh, or jump into a river to save a child that's dying. But would he do that uh, to save a box of Kleenex or a leftover piece of toast? It depends on what's important to you, what you're willing to sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed his life for the church. And his death is more important than any other death we've already seen. It's essential to salvation. He died to save us. If he died to save us, but he died to purchase the church, doesn't that show how important the church is? The connection to the church and the death of Jesus shows that rather than setting aside the church as not being important, it shows that the church is important to us. Furthermore, the Bible teaches that uh, the gospel is the power that, uh, rather the church rather, is the group that Jesus adds all saved people to, Acts 2.47. The Lord adds the saved to the church. What if we're not in the church? If the saved are added to the church, if we're not in the church, what does that mean? If the church was purchased by the blood of Jesus, we're not in the church, then we haven't been purchased by the blood of Jesus, right? We don't belong to Jesus. If we want to be among the number of those who have been purchased by the blood of Jesus, that's forgiveness. If we want to be among that number, we have to be in the church. Look in Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 23 and 25. Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 23, and then again in verse 25. Talking about husbands and wives is an illustration 
He says, the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. So Christ is head of the church, Savior of the body. The body is the church, according to chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. And then verse 25, husbands loved your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So he is the savior of the body of the church. He gave himself for the church. Remember, he gave his death, he gave himself to save us. So if he's the savior of the body and he gave himself for the church, what about people who are outside the church? They'll be saved if we're not in the church. To say the church is not important is to fail to understand the connection between the church and Jesus' death. Suppose a business company, some of you men, may, maybe a business company, gives a bonus check at a certain time of the year to every employee of the company. But if a person's not an employee of that company, can they claim that check? No. The company gives the check, but you have to be an employee. You have to be a part of the group to receive that benefit. Likewise, the same without, with regard to Jesus, he's the savior of the church, the body. How can we expect to be saved then if we're not a part of that body? If we're not a member of that group or if we're a member of some other group other than his religious body. So somebody says, oh, you're saying then the church saves us. No. No. That's not what I said and that's not what the scriptures, more important, that's not what the scriptures said. The passage say Jesus is the savior. Not the church, Jesus. The question is, whom does Jesus save? The pastors say he's the savior of the body, the church. The church does not give its salvation. The church is the people who receive salvation. But those who receive it are all in the church. That's what the passage has said. If a father offers an inheritance to every child in his family, who gives the inheritance? Not the children, the father gives the inheritance. But you have to be in the family to receive it. The same way Jesus is the giver of salvation. His blood is the, what saves us. But to receive that benefit, we have to be in the family, the church. We have to be in a part of denomination to be saved? No, no, that's not it either. All modern denominations are unknown in the scripture. They're human in origin. They constitute religious division. And membership in them is not what God ever taught anybody to do. But there is a church that Jesus built. His church that we've seen, he purchased. He built it. He purchased it with his blood. And membership in that church is essential to salvation. So when people say that the church is not important, or that they realize they're not, what they're really saying, that mean, what that would mean is that the blood of Jesus is not important. Because Jesus' blood is what makes the church important. I think it's important for us to, to get those things clear in our minds that when people say the church isn't important or the gospel is not important or whatever, they don't see the connection between the blood of Jesus and these other things. When we get it clear in our mind, then we see these things are important, not because they're important of themselves or would be of themselves, but because the blood of Jesus makes them important. That's what makes in particular now the church important. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. So, the cross of Christ is important, essential to forgiveness. The church is, the gospel rather, is the message we learn about the blood of Christ. The church is the people who have received the blessing of forgiveness of the blood of Christ. But now let's look at the connection to baptism. A lot of people say the similar thing that they say about the church. They say, well, you're saved by the death of Jesus. Baptism has nothing to do with it, so they tell us. So they tell us, Jesus did everything. He did it all when he died. And I don't know how many people have me tell me that over the internet. When they read my stuff on the internet, they send me emails, Jesus did it all. There's nothing for us to do. We should talk about the man and not the plan. In the first place, they really don't mean what they're saying. Because if Jesus did it all and there's nothing for us to do, then you can't even believe in him. You, you have no choice at all. If he did it all, you don't have any choice of any kind. So they really don't really understand the significance of what they're saying. But what the Bible teaches us, nevertheless, is that the blood of Jesus, the cross of Christ, is what makes the baptism important. Dipping in water would not be important of itself if it were not for the connection to the 
blood of Jesus. When you see the connection, that's what makes baptism important. The Bible says the blood of Jesus gives remission in baptism. Look at me in Matthew 26, verse 28, first of all. Matthew 26 and verse 28. Jesus said, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Notice that expression, for the remission of sins. The passage says, Jesus shed his blood for the remission of, for many for the remission of sins. Is he saying he shed his blood that they might receive remission of sins or because they already have it? Well, that's obvious. He didn't shed his blood because people already had the remission of sins. He shed his blood so the people could receive the remission of sins. For the remission of sins means that they might receive the remission of sins. Now look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and compare that to that passage. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Acts 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You should receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And look at that. Matthew 26, verse 28. Jesus shed his blood for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. What does that mean? Well, for the remission of sins, and that Matthew 26, 28 meant in order to receive the remission of sins. Forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of sins in Acts 2, 38 must mean the same thing. To receive the forgiveness. Some people say, well, no, it doesn't mean in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. It means because of the remission of sins. Be baptized because you already have the remission of sins. We know that that's not what it means in Matthew 26, 28. It doesn't mean because you have it. He didn't die because we have it. He died that we might receive it. And so in Acts 2, 38, it should mean the same thing. Be baptized in order to receive it. But let's, uh, let me explain this. What, for me, is the simplest way to show people that Acts 2.38, for the remission of sins, means in order to receive it. And the answer, the way to understand that, that doesn't mean because they already have it, it means in order that they might receive it, is to look at the people who he's talking to. If when Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, if that means because you already have it, then the people he was talking to already had remission, right? He's talking to a group of people. Did those people already have remission of sins? Did they be baptized because they already had it? Or did they need to be baptized in order to receive remission of sins? Well, look at it. He, first of all, if they already had remission of sins, why did he tell them to repent? They just got through saying, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he says, repent. But if they already have remission of sins, why does he tell them to repent? But he wasn't talking to people who were saved, telling them what to do because they are already saved. He's telling them, he's talking to sinners who have just been convicted that they're guilty of sin. Who are asking what to do about it. And he's telling them to repent and telling them how to be forgiven. Not because they already are forgiven, but to be forgiven. Acts 2.38 does not mean repent and be baptized because you already have remission. It means repent and be baptized in order to receive remission because that's what the people needed. But the same thing must be true for everybody then, according to Acts 2.38. We must all repent and be baptized in order to receive remission of sins. But furthermore, the scriptures say then that we are, our sins are washed away in baptism. Revelation 1 and verse 5, Jesus says he, we told that Jesus washed us from our sins in his blood. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away a person's sins. But look with me in Acts 22 and verse 16, where Saul explains how he was, his sins were washed away. Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias was sent to him to tell him what to do to be forgiven. And here's what Ananias said, Acts 22 and verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What did Paul have, Saul have to do to have his sins washed away? He had to be, arise and be baptized. Now water doesn't have, dipping in water doesn't have the power of itself to cleanse sin. The power is in Jesus' blood. The question is, when does the blood cleanse? And what do we have to do to be cleansed? Well, we already learned from the gospel. We have to hear and believe the gospel and so on. We have to repent and be baptized. But it's when we're baptized, the blood of Jesus washes away the sins. 
And look at the case of Saul. Look at the case of the person being discussed here. This is talking to Saul of Tarsus. He'd already seen Jesus on the road to Damascus and believed in him. He was willing to obey. He said, what do you want me to do? He'd even been praying. Now look at the context tells us. But he still had his sins until he was baptized. And so he was told by inspiration, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. People who realize that the blood of Christ is what they need to be forgiven, and people who follow the teaching of the gospel need to recognize the need for baptism because baptism is what the scriptures say to do to receive the cleansing of the blood. Furthermore, the blood of Jesus saves us in baptism. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 9 Jesus died, we're told, so we may be justified by his blood and saved from wrath. So we're justified by the blood of Jesus. But Mark 16, 16 says he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Put the two together. We're saved by the blood. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. So we believe and we're baptized. We're saved by the blood. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Baptism also now saves us. Not It says not just that we getting clean in the water, but the blood of Jesus. That's the power that saves us in his resurrection. But to receive that blood, we have to be baptized, you see. So it would, you put it together. The passage says you're saved by the blood. We're saved in baptism. So baptism is what you have to do to reach the blood. Suppose a man had a terminal disease. He goes to the doctor, uh, and the doctor says, I have a pill that will cure that disease. Now, is the man automatically cured because there's a pill? No, he has to apply the, the, the remedy. He has to follow the instructions in order to get the remedy. So the doctor says, swallow one of these pills each day for a week and you'll be cured. Now, would we say, well, that man was saved by swallowing? Well, in a way, you could say that, not because swallowing in general, not just, lots of people swallow and they're not cured of diseases, but it's a swallowing of itself. But the swallowing is what he needed to do to apply the remedy, the cure. The medicine is what saves him, but he has to obey the instructions to apply the medicine. That's what the Bible is saying about baptism. Sin is a spiritually terminal disease. The only cure is the blood of Jesus Christ. That cure is available to everybody, but to receive the cure, the blood must be applied. How do you apply it? What we've been learning is you hear and you believe the gospel, you repent, and you're baptized. When you're baptized, you've applied the cure the way the gospel says you must do to be cleansed and be forgiven of your sins. And so then, the scriptures say that we're baptized into Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness is available, as we've seen, in Christ. But to receive the blessings, we have to come into Christ. How do you come into Christ? See, all these verses, all these approaches come down to the same thing. The blood of Jesus cleanses you if you're in Christ, in the church. How do you come into Christ? You that, Romans 6 and verse 3, do you not know there's many of us who were baptized into Christ? We were baptized into his death. You come into his death in baptism. You come into, uh, come into Christ in baptism. And that's where you receive the forgiveness of your sins. Now this next illustration might work better in January, but suppose it's January and instead of <laughs> the weather we're having, we're having, it's a terrible snowstorm. Somebody's outside in this terrible, cold, dark winter snowstorm at night. They come across a house that looks warm and bright and dry. What do they, want to, what do they have to do if they want the comfort? When they're out there in the cold and the dark, they want the comfort of being warm and bright. What do they have to do? They have to come into the house. As long as they stay outside, they're still in the, the cold and the snow and so on. If they want to be warm and dry, they have to come into the house. Now consider a person who's in the darkness of sin, who wants the blessing of forgiveness. What, what must he do? Come into Christ. How does he do that? Through the teaching of the gospel. He hears and he believes and he repents and he confesses Christ and he's baptized into Christ. That's how he comes into Christ where the death of Christ and the salvation and forgiveness can be found. So you see, the gospel of Jesus Christ ties the blood of Christ 
so closely to baptism that you can't be saved by the blood without the baptism. And when people belittle the importance of baptism, what they have done is, whether they realize it or not, they've belittled the importance of Jesus' blood. Because you can only reach the blood in baptism. When you see the connection between Jesus' death and these other things we're talking about, you begin to see that the blood of Jesus is what makes other things important. It's not, we're not making up the fact that the church is important, or the gospel is important, or baptism is important. Those things are important because Jesus' blood is important. Not, you can't separate them according to the gospel. They go together. Well, now another area, and that is faithful living. And once again, we see that there are people who don't see a connection between the death of Jesus and how we live. They say sometimes, well, all you have to do is be forgiven of your sins, be cleansed, and they may even believe in baptism. They may even believe in the church. But if they've been stick, cleansed and saved, they think that's all there is to it. And so we have once saved, always saved, and how you live after you're forgiven won't affect your eternal destiny and so on. And some, even in the church, have taught the idea that if you've been baptized properly, then if your worship isn't right or you're part of a congregation that isn't organized right or doesn't do the right work, God will overlook it. It doesn't affect your salvation because you were baptized right and so on. Well, look at what we can learn about a faithful life after baptism from the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus teaches us about how to live our lives just like it teaches about these other things. And so, for example, look at Titus chapter 2, and verses 11 through 14. Titus chapter 2, and verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that's his death, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, that's the forgiveness, and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. So the blood of Jesus Christ, his death, his sacrifice, teaches us that we should, uh, he says, uh, live soberly, righteously, and godly, and be zealous of good works. The same death of Christ, the same sacrifice that teaches us about the gospel and the church and teaches us to live godly lives. That's what he died for, that we might live godly lives and be zealous of good works. Baptism and Entering the church, that's not the end result of Jesus' blood. That's not that. We got that and we're done. It's just the beginning. That makes us disciples, and now our responsibility is to live the life of a disciple. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus. That if one died for all, that's Christ, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should not should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them, and rose again. Jesus died for you. He died for me. What should we learn from that? Well, one thing we learn is that we should live for him. He made that sacrifice to save us and forgive us. We want that forgiveness. We want that cleansing. We want that hope of eternal life. We must be willing to live for it. You do not go through the motions of baptism and think that you're saved now and there's nothing to do afterwards. You must understand a responsibility to live a life of a faithful disciple of Christ. Sometimes we have the idea, well, it's my life, so I'll live it the way I want. No, no, it's not your life. When Jesus dies for you, he's purchased you. They already belong to God in the first place because he made you, but if you become a Christian and you receive the blood of Jesus Christ, now you belong to him. And now your life is to be lived for him. There are couples that go through thousands of dollars and many hours to arrange a beautiful wedding. But a wedding ceremony is not all there is to marriage. It's just the beginning. If you want to receive the blessings of a good marriage, 
You're going to have to work at it all the rest of your life. That's the way it works. This idea that you get married and you live happily ever after, so that's, everything's going to be great from then on, that's a fairy tale. Marriage is good only if you work at it. The wedding ceremony is the beginning. That's the same thing we're saying about being forgiven by the blood of Christ. You need to do it, but you need to understand that's just the beginning. You have to do it to receive eternal life, but you also have to work at it all the rest of your life in order ultimately to receive the blessing. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. 1 John chapter 1, and verse 7 through 9. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. The blood cleanses us, but what do we have to do? Walk in the light. That's the gospel. Follow the gospel. But you have to continue to do that, you see. And the blood cleanses us. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you want to become a Christian, the gospel says the blood of Jesus will cleanse you when believing in him, repent and confess him and are baptized. Then you're added to the church, the saved. But you must then, from then on, you walk in the light. Now you will sin again, because everybody does. Not that it's right, but we do. What do we do about that? We confess our sins. Acts 8.22, repent and pray to God. Then he cleanses us again. But that commits and we're committed to walking in the light, to live the life that he requires in his word. Second John verse 9 through 11, if we transgress and do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, we have not God. So, yes, we become into Christ when we're baptized, a part of the church. But if we begin to practice things that are not in the doctrine of Christ and continue in those practices and don't repent and are not forgiven, then we will not have the eternal life that we could receive. We have not God. And so, when people belittle the need for a faithful life, what they've really done, whether they realize it or not, is they belittle the need for the blood of Jesus. It goes together. The gospel is important. The church is important. Baptism is important. A faithful life is important. All these things we talk about are important, not because people have said so, not because the church made it up, but because Jesus' death is important. When you understand Jesus' death, you understand why you need all these other things and why you can't be saved without them. And so if we want the benefits of Jesus' death, we have to accept the consequences. We have to accept the responsibilities. And we can talk about a number of other things, I might add. The same principle would apply to uh, the importance of Jesus' resurrection, and the importance of Jesus' second coming, and on. We can, the, why are those things important? Why do we need to teach about those things? Because it's all based on the death of Jesus. When we see the death of Jesus, how it applies in all these other areas, we see our responsibilities to live a life of obedience and faithfulness to the gospel. And so, some people have never received the benefits of Jesus' death because they've never properly been uh, baptized to receive the forgiveness. They've never properly become part of Jesus' church and entered into his service. Others have begun to serve, but they've fallen away. They haven't lived a faithful life. When we understand Jesus' death, then we understand it. the gospel tells us how to become a disciple, how to continue serving him, that we can receive eternal life. So where are you then tonight? Have you received the blessings of the blood of Jesus Christ according to the gospel by the baptism and become part of his church? Are you willing to do that tonight if you need to? Or have you fallen away and not been truly keeping your responsibility as a follower of Jesus Christ? If you need the prayers of the congregation, whatever you need, why don't you come and make it known as we stand and while we sing this evening. <laughs>